Uh, it should be live now. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you everyone for attending today this uh, new seminar, uh, Safari Live seminar, also join uh, EFCL seminar today. Um, thank you very, very much everyone attending in Zoom and also in YouTube. And a special thanks to Tyla, uh, the uh, lead of the EFCL for coordinating uh, all of that. Um, I'm, I have the pleasure to introduce uh, Fabrice Debo, who is uh, the CTO and uh, one of the co-founders of the uh, Abmem company, a French startup that has uh, designed and fabricated and commercializes the first real world processing in memory architecture. It's a very uh, interesting work, uh, pioneering effort uh, that uh, it's um, actually already showing very uh, interesting results and hopefully it will be even better uh, in next generations. I think that Fabrice is going to talk uh, a little bit about the evolution of the architecture. Uh, together with me, I have uh, as co-hosts Hayu, uh, Mohamed and Geraldo, who are members of the Safari Research Group. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, guys, for your help. Uh, please help me monitoring the questions in the YouTube chat and also in, in Zoom. And I hope that we will have also a very interesting discussion after, uh, the, after the end of the talk. Uh, Fabrice, thank you very much again. And feel free to start whenever you're ready. OK, so thank you for inviting me. And I start right now. Um, so just uh, a nice picture of um, an actual DIM. You there is startups out there that claim to be PIM, to do PIM, but you have nice 3D rendering. We, we do have cheap. That's <laughs> um, Fabrice, you may want to uh, uh, go for a presentation mode in PowerPoint. Um, uh, Up to you. <laughs> no, okay. I have a better experience. Usually it's fail miserably. So I prefer keeping the, the, the side row very small, but full mod, um, sometimes uh, troubles. I have okay. To... So. Makes uh, sense. Um, okay, so this is, um, uh, this is the first, effectively the first uh, PIM architecture that is commercially a rebel that, that you can buy and that you can use. Um, so it's based on four gigabit uh, DRAM memory chip. That's the best chip, I will say, uh, which have been augmented by the addition of eight processors on the same die. This processor being uh, our own, designed by Upmem. Uh, on uh, we deliver uh, so DIM modules with sixteen chips, and uh, they are compliant with the DDR4 uh, two thousand four hundred uh, st standards. So. Um, and uh, so typically you, you, you will plug them, uh, you will populate uh, most of the slot of a, server, uh, of a server with them. And this will add thousands of cores uh, to your server. And um, it's allowed to, uh, to get uh, something like by, by, by 10, between by 10 by 20, uh, performance boost on, on the applications that have been ported to our technology. And the power efficiency is 10 times better. And um, this is likely, this will even be better with uh, the next generation, which will be more uh, power, uh, uh, power conscious. So, um, so what, we, what we did is really to put a processor into the main memory die. We, we do not make calculation into the memory array itself. Our processor is just placed along the memory die, uh, the memory array inside the memory die. Uh, so the data has to travel far less uh, distance and uh, moving uh, in and out the data on a long distance on, on, uh, uh, on the PCB typically, it's, it costs a lot of energy. So by keeping most of the data movement inside the chip, it's reduced uh, energy consumption a lot. Um, on uh, what we propose today is the first uh, is the first PIM uh, chip that uses uh, an unmodified uh, DRAM process. 
in the past, uh, people have, have done uh, PIM using an embedded DRAM process. And uh, the problem is that embedded DRAM processes are not, um, they are not mainstream at all. They are late with respect to the DRAM process and so on. So you, you don't have, you, you don't, uh, you, um, they are not that relevant anymore. Um, so it was very important to use uh, unmodified DRAM process. Um, and uh, what we bring uh, to the table is uh, that our chip use a main memory, a mainstream memory interface, on a main, um, support mainstream languages, programming languages. Uh, this is very important because uh, you, you have to to adapt to the to the market where where it is and the way it is on. Uh, to adapt to interfaces which are not PIM friendly, but which are just mainstream. Um, and that's a good time to do so because uh, the, the applications are more data intensive than ever. I will say uh, not too high calculation on very large set of data. So that's a perfect uh, fit for PIM because when you have each calculation or small set of data, your data is a, is a can be cached, uh, cached, cached uh, efficiently. Uh, but when you have a, la a very large data set and your calculations are not that long on each of these data, but you have so many of them, uh, then PIM is extremely relevant. And uh, one of the things is that we are out of solution of improving the speed of classical processors uh, because due to the memory wall on, on the, the, the tapering of the, of the Moro, <laughs> to, to say the least. So, uh, so our module uh, are uh, aimed to, to replace standard DIMMs. On the server, you will keep uh, standard DIMMs for the main memory, non-PIM memory, and then you will populate the remaining of the slot with, uh, with uh, our, our DIMMs. Uh, and you will have uh, inside, uh, so inside each DRAM chip, you have uh, uh, so a four gigabit uh, DRAM, so 500 uh, uh, megabyte worth of memory. And then you have eight processors, uh, eight processors, we call them DPUs, they are currently ranging, uh, running uh, between three, 350 and uh, 425 megahertz. Uh, the next generation will run between 500 and 600 megahertz. Uh, each of each DRAM chip is single die. It's not a stacked technology. It uses a, a standard uh, 25 nanometer DRAM process and modified. Uh, and it provides a very large uh, bandwidth. Uh, for example, if you have 128 gigabyte of, of uh, our DRAMs, PIM DRAMs, uh, then you have an excess of two terabytes of uh, memory bandwidth. And this memory bandwidth will be increased in the next generation. Um, and one key thing is that uh, our processors are programmable in C uh, and in Rust. Um, we will see if we if we port other language to our processor, if there is a need, is a need for this. So um, the application which are particularly relevant for PIM, um, I would say genomic really is a is a very good application because the locality of calculation is uh, is very important. Um, and there is, and this is a, a field which is which is growing a lot, and citing more and more interest. So that's a, that's a very good application for PIM. Uh, index search, which is exploiting um, a database. Um, database search are, are good, for, present a very good parallelism. So they are perfectly fit for for PIM processing, and. Other, uh, other algorithms, uh, anal uh, uh, analytic algorithms that, that will uh, apply a lot, uh, um, that fit, fit effectively the definition of doing not that much calculation, but on an huge set of data. Uh, and, 
which are, which are like e effectively a good fit for PIM. Um, there are other applications on uh, the, the thing is that PIM is brand, brand new, I would say, so that uh, uh, the, the, the applications that are good fit for PIM, they are uh, discovered. Uh, I would say that uh, really, um, uh, it's, it's only the beginning, I would say, that more and more application will be amenable to PIM. Um, so we have a, pro a processor which has a very long pipeline, despite the frequency that, that it's uh, low by, by usual processor standard. This is due to the fact that DRAM processes are not intended to be efficient on logic. They are really specialized on uh, supporting the, the memory array. Uh, so everything is far more difficult to do on the DRAM process than on a standard uh, logic process like a TSMC process or, or a global foundry process and, and this kind of processes, logic processes. So we have a long pipeline. Um, on this pipeline is a, is a revolver type pipeline, not exactly that definition, but the important fact is that inside the pipeline, uh, you will have instruction from different threads. Uh, no thread will have more than one instruction inside the pipeline. Um, so that's uh, on. Um, so th this is a multi-threaded pipeline. On the first generation, we have 24 threads. On the next generation, we will have only 16 because uh, our experience return has shown that 16 is a uh, uh, is enough. I mean that uh, that users are, are happy with 16 and, and don't use uh, all uh, the 24. So we can we can uh, spare some area on energy on this. Um, but the point when you have uh, many threads is that you don't have caches because otherwise what will happen is that the threads will fight over the ownership of cache lines and you will have a very inefficient architecture. Uh, and, um, and we have been forced this way around. I mean that when you see the performance of the DRAM process, you are forced to have a long pipeline to use multi-trading. And then the consequence is that you don't have caches. Um, so we have only a 64 a kilobyte SRAM working memory. Um, and we have an instruction memory, which is 24 kilobytes, uh, just 4 kilo, uh, 4K uh, instructions, our instruction band being 40, uh, 48 bit wide. Uh, and we have uh, DMA instructions, which are capable of moving uh, data between the DRAM array, so a bank, which is 64 megabytes of data, uh, so to move this data uh, in one direction and the other between the, this uh, uh, 64 megabyte of DRAM data and the 64 kilobyte of, of fast memory that is uh, directly accessible by the pipe. Uh, these are really DMA instructions. This is not, the DMA is not a peripheral. It is really interrogated into the instruction set, which make it easy to use and efficient. Uh, and you, you don't have to synchronize wasting, oh, is the DMA busy by another thread and so No, you just have a DMA instruction and the hardware will take, take care of everything. And the DMA instruction just say, uh, move uh, this area from the work RAM to the, uh, to, the DR, to the DRAM, we call it MRAM or vice versa. And your thread will continue execution when this data movement is done. Um, so the, the DMA operation are decoupled from the pipeline and in particular, uh, threads that are waiting for the completion of the DMA instruction, they are removed from the pipeline, such that they don't take slots from the thing because they cannot advance yet. Uh, while threads uh, which have not issued uh, a DMA instruction or whose DMA instruction are complete, uh, they freely run in the, in the pipeline without being affected by the DMA operation. 
Um, so that's a, a, an aerial view of uh, our, uh, our chip uh, for the for the first the first generation chip. Um, oh, there is a dot here. <laughs> uh, so uh, so we have a, a, a control interface which enables uh, the host application to control. Uh, to control the DPU through our library. Uh, we have the 64 megabytes DRAM array, and there is, a, so this corresponds to one uh, DDR4 bank. You have eight times eight time this, this, these things. You have the DMA engine moving data between the DMA array and the work program. Uh, the DMA engine is equally capable of loading the instruction memory with instruction that are in the, inside the, the, DR, the DRAM array. And you have the pipeline, and uh, you have an interface enabling uh, the host, typically an 86 server, but uh, ARM server could, could, be, could do the job as well, uh, to control the uh, program execution at a higher level, typically uh, starting uh, program execution, checking that the program is done, or uh, um, Checking, uh, checking if there is a program has done a, a fault or whatever. Um, so the, the, an important point is that uh, the server, so the DPUs are very autonomous. I mean, they can execute complex programs for very long duration without the involvement of the server CPU. Um, and uh, all the all the DPU, its memory, everything is mapped in the cacheable space. It is it is more difficult to handle cacheable space from the host point of view, but uh, that's the only high performance address space we can use from the server uh, because non cacheable space is. Uh, is is not a first class citizen on a server. It is almost uh, it's almost obsolete. Uh, it's so the performance is a, a, a bit small usually. So that's the reason why uh, our processor, the control register, everything is mapped in the cacheable space, and we handle the cache coherency by software using uh, explicit cache management instruction. Uh, so. All these uh, stuff are hidden into uh, a library, uh, such that the programmer is not bothered uh, with with this with these things. And we we hide the the bus with mismatch. We will we will see this later on. Uh, the address interleaving, the fact that we have no cache currency because when a DPU change the content of the DRAM, the 86 caches are not aware of this, so we have to deal with and validating uh, the part, the, the adequate part of the cache, 86 cache, such that it will fetch uh, the data which has been changed. And the, another problem is that we have no hardware arbitration. We have to deal with the fact that a DPU cannot access the DRAM array while uh, allowing the 86 to access the DRAM array as, as well. You, we have uh, some kind of a multiplexer on and we, we turn this multiplexer one way or one other according to the, to the software, to the application di um, directive that's uh, managed by the, by the library. So um, these are the kind of things that the library manage in theory. So typically, uh, when uh, you do a calculation using our technology, uh, the DPU calculation time is the longest one, and uh, the calculation time is not impacted by the time the 86 server uh, need uh, for executing its part. So that's what we call to be in the, in the calculation shadow of the DPU, and uh, it's make that the 86 server is not a limiting factor of the, of the technology. Um, but the, the, the time, the calculation time on the 86 can be significant, but it's always smaller than, than the DPU calculation time. That's the typical situation. Um, so this block diagram represents what the next generation will bring. Um, the, we change uh, 
the control interface a lot, search that in fact or the RAM can seem to be a standard DRAM at boot time. This way we don't have to, to, uh, uh, to adapt the BIOS. And then we will use, we use a patented technology to tell the DRAM, uh, the DIM, uh, that we want the PIM functionality and then the local interface will become visible while before it was not, it was not visible in the address space. Uh, and one other aspect is that this new generation will have uh, the capacity uh, for the DPU to be to work as a secure enclaves. Uh, and uh, the root of trust, the booting of uh, and the creation of a root of trust inside the DPUs is done uh, through a global interface, which is driven by a small um, secure microcontroller on, on the DIM. And uh, we have a encryption signing inside the DPU DRAMs such that the root of trust can be, can be built. And this way, our DPUs will have the ability to be used as secure enclaves or to be used in a norm, their uh, normal previous capacity. And when they are in the secure enclave mode, uh, the secure application will be able to define the size of a mailbox, of a shared area into the DRAM array, such that the host and the secure application can communicate into this area. Uh, and the remaining of the memory array being, uh, being protected from the, from the host access, and such that you can have secure calculation done on the PIM uh, on, on behalf of the, of the server uh, processor. So that's one of the points, one of the difficulty in this technology is that the DRAM chips have a narrow data bus. Uh, the, the data buses are typical, uh, are eight bit wide. Uh, so uh, when the uh, 86 write a 64 bit word, the problem is that the word is not in the right orientation. Uh, so we make a matrix transformation such that the words as uh, the words, if you see them as lines, then they become columns. And then each DPU will be will be able to see complete 64-bit world. Uh, that's that's very um, that's essential to to allow this this technology to work. And this is done by the um, communication library. Uh, search that this kind of transformation is entirely hidden from the application programmer. And obviously we do this to write into our DPUs, but when we are reading, we do the, the reverse transformation. We, we read the columns and we turn them into lines, search that the data uh, is coherent between the 86 and the DPUs. This means that there is a vectorial aspect to this is that uh, you can write or read from several DPUs at once, and that it is interesting to organize your application such that this is a common case, because otherwise, an uh, important part of the bandwidth uh, between the host and the DPUs uh, could be lost. Um, but anyway, since most of the calculation occur into the DPUs, this is not uh, this is not a huge, uh, an huge consideration. So um, the journey to move, uh, to export the beam taking technology is typically that you, you have your application, you have to identify uh, the part of the application that are uh, eligible for PIM. Uh, on to move this calculation uh, to, to the DPUs, such that your application now will be will have some part of this calculation done on the on the server, on the remaining of the calculation done on the DPUs. Um, on uh, the, the server processor, typically, uh, it is uh, orchestrators of the DPU calculation. It will uh, feed them with calculation to do. It will collect the results from these DPUs, uh, possibly performing final calculation on this, on this result. Um, 
so that that um, um, that realizes uh, the the common the common scenario. So on the thing is that uh, PIM, PIM eligible applications that just the application where most of the calculation are local, local enough to be done on DPUs, and then you will just dispatch this, this calculation to the DPUs, collect the result, um, merge the result if needed, and so on. Okay, so uh, the server, the server processor, uh, orchestrating thousands of process of DPU process. Um, and we have um, an SDK which supports this model of programming, such that you have your uh, your part of your application which will be executed on the server, and the part of your application which will be executed on the DPU, on so that you can uh, in, in, in a in a in a sufficiently friendly way under the two aspects of the of, the, of your program and uh, then uh, we, we provide uh, okay we have a cycle accurate software simulator uh, uh, um, um, just a functional simulator which is faster but not uh, not cycle accurate fpga emulators and the most important things we have actual hardware and we, we are the only ones of, of uh, having actual hardware, but that's important. That hardware that you can use, because uh, <laughs> if you have HBM chip, that's nice, but you need an, uh, you are from something like 18 months to, to use it <laughs> in, the, in, the, in the best case. So, um, so the, the SDK reflects the fact that you will have to manage uh, program execution on, on on two different processors, um, but that's a reasonable task on the on the performance boost is, is worth it. So I would say that um, the, the key point of the DPU architecture. Um, so uh, if there's uh, questions, they are welcome. Okay, thank you very much. Fabrice, uh, thank you very much for uh, this um, quick but also dense introduction to the architecture. Um, I would like to ask to the audience here in Zoom if there are any questions. Also in, in YouTube, feel free to ask. Uh, I will keep an eye on the on the chat. Okay, maybe I can start myself um, with the first one. Um, uh, you mentioned that the uh, next generation is going to uh, increase the memory bandwidth. I understand, my, my understanding is that you mean the memory bandwidth uh, from the MRAM to the pipeline, to the DRAM bank, to the pipeline of the DPU. Um, could you elaborate, elaborate a little bit on how you plan to do so? Um, in fact, we have room for, uh, for doubling the bandwidth. But in the next generation, you will have the ability to define a part of your MRAM, which will be uh, ECC protected. Uh, on, on due to this, uh, when you have ECC, uh, you, you need more bandwidth because you will, you will read uh, ECC, ECC syndrome from the MRAM array as well. So, so when we turn the MRAM into an ECC mode, instead of having 64 megabytes of MRAM, your application program will see only uh, 58.5 megabytes of MRAM. The remaining part being lost uh, for the ECC functionality. And this will be programmable such that you can have the mailbox between the 86 and the DPU not using ECC. And then all the remaining part of the, mem of the DRAM memory using ECC, for example, such that the application is not bothered by calculating the ECC and uh, on, on handling the ECC by software. Um, but the point is that it will reduce somewhat the bandwidth. And since we, uh, we have the capability to try the bandwidth, then the decision has been made to, to, to increase this. There is not a, such a big requirement to increase bandwidth because the bandwidth we have is already very high with respect to the, to the speed of calculation of a DPU. 
uh, this is some kind of two-step anticipation because the next uh, generation, the generation after the, the next one, will be a super scalar uh, architecture capable of executing two instructions every cycle. So at this point, then this additional bandwidth will be will be uh, more needed than 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 for the next just the next generation. So uh, since we have this CCM reduction on, uh, um, so that's an, an an improvement that we can do. It won't change. The, the most, uh, the biggest and performance improvement will come just from the uh, just inc increasing the shear frequency uh, in the next generation. And this will be feasible because we will improve greatly the power performance, the power efficiency of our processor. Uh, the, the next generation will really more, be more power efficient. Um, something you should be able to see in the, in the last iteration of the current generation uh, that will have already uh, significantly uh, uh, significant power reduction. And um, today we need to be more power efficient to increase the frequency. So that's, that's uh, uh, we work this way. So this um, bandwidth uh, improvement, uh, it was not uh, a requirement because uh, the characteristic of the of the uh, of the performance of the system today show that we have an adequate bandwidth. It's more an anticipation of the future with the ECC support, which consumes some bandwidth. And then when we will have the super scalar version, then effectively more bandwidth will be required. And so that's a, that's a way to implement it in an incremental fashion. Mm -hmm. Okay, that makes sense. And I also think that the path that you're tracing uh, makes perfect sense. I wanted to actually uh, ask you about the relation or the, in the current architecture that, as you know, we have analyzed uh, the relation between the available bandwidth and the speed of the uh, DPUs, because uh, one interesting thing that we observe is that the memory bandwidth problem is solved, and uh, and now uh, we should try to uh, make um, the processors again faster, or uh, at least it's the responsibility of the programmer or the compiler to make the code more efficient. And I think that's uh, that's uh, a pretty nice uh, an interesting uh, observation. We. Um... Effectively, we, we, are, we have to make an incremental approach more than, uh, more than a classical process because um, the, DRAM, the DRAM processes are so, so much uh, so more difficult to, to, to design for that really it is very important to, um, uh, to build on your experience and to Okay, to have to, to make maybe one could consider that we are we, the the change between the first generation and the next generation are are, are not groundbreaking, uh, but in fact uh, we increase the performance, we increase the, the power efficiency, uh, we simplify the the, uh, the integration greatly because we will have. Uh, uh, al almost no modification on the BIOS side, which is really very challenging to do. Uh, we have this ECC support. We have this uh, secure enclave mode. So in fact, the chip is is uh, almost completely uh, overhauled. <laughs> it's okay, completely uh, redone for to achieve this all these things. Um, and um, yes, you, you cannot just say, oh, I have a final process, then I will do uh, a brand new design with more pipelines. No, that's um, uh, because, for example, just that people realize that how difficult it is. On, um, on a logic process, you will have something like 10 to 12 or some process logic of 17 uh, layer of metals for routing. On the DRAM process, you have three layers. And they are very bad. <laughs> and the, the, the pitch between the wire are absolutely not the one you would expect from a, from a 
logic process named accordingly, oh, 25 nanometer process, so it must be this kind of pitch. No, the pitch typically they are free, free time in each dimension, you have three times less wire than a logic process. And we have only three plane to root. So if you make the, the sum, the, 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 the Duran process is uh, far less capable of routing complex things. And so we have to be extremely careful to what we implement, the way we implement things, just to, to have them feasible. Um, so that, that's, that's really the whole challenge. That's really, that's why that spin is brand new is because that's very difficult and, and people have tried and failed many times. And uh, so far we are the first ones to, to, to have done a whole processor into, into a, on a DRAM process. So um, effectively this increase of bandwidth is not a, that's, that big a change for our design. Paradoxically, that's, that's so it, it is, I would not call it a long gig fruit, but it was not that high in the tree. So we, we know perfectly well that uh, that's, that's not a performance pain point, but it will allow us to introduce ECC support as no without any performance impact. In fact, a slight, a slight performance increase. Um, uh, we were thinking that it was good to offer ECCs just to say, okay, you can have ECC, you just re it just reduces your memory capacity, uh, but that's all. So that, that was uh, that's uh, why you, the reason why we uh, we we picked this this fruit. It was not too difficult to do on um, uh, yes. So if it's not really difficult to be not done, on the, not to be done on the first generation, you say that you, you manage your risk on, on your, you should, so now that we, uh, we have a first design uh, past us and this was a, an easy pick. And then the next, next generation, we will do a super scalar design, uh, which will have more threads on, uh, on which will be capable of executing two instructions of two different threads every, every second. Mm -hmm. So it will start uh, taking advantage of uh, instruction level parallelism as well. Uh, yes, that's uh, the, the the third generation will be a, a, a big change and a, a big technical change, really a big technical change. Uh, uh, because to do a super a super scalar design uh, on the Duran process, that's <laughs> that's challenging for the. Yeah, I can imagine. Okay, yeah, um, let me see if there are questions uh, here. Uh, guys, feel free to ask any questions. I have a question from uh, Mohamed Alser. He wants to ask you, uh, is there a benchmark comparison with the new Samsung in-memory devices? Oh, um, there, there isn't. And um, I mean, these, uh, these are completely different beasts. Uh, because the Samsung uh, PIM, it's not a product, in fact, uh, technology is only focused on uh, inference uh, done in floating point. Um, the program is 32 instructions long. Uh, that's the biggest program you can write on their, on their chip. The instruction set comprise nine instructions, including an op. Uh, we have in excess of 100 instructions, different instructions, and programs can launch up to 4,000 instructions on our side. And um, if you want to use Aquabolt technology, and you, you need an ASIC, you need to make your interposer, you need to make your HBN stacks using the Aquabolt technology, and you're done. So instead of sending an order to UpMem, you will just have to uh, go for cost in, in tens of millions of dollars and wait something like 80 on, on, on have your product maybe in 18 months. So I will say that we have a product, others do a, a proof of concept. Interesting, we follow, we follow what they are doing. We have no doubts the reverse is true as well. Um, 
what to say. That's completely two different things. The, uh, the Samsung Aqua Bolt is really uh, an announcer of uh, an, uh, floating point inference for an ASIC. So that's really a specialized chip. I would not call it programmable. I will, it's configurable. And you have to write in assembly and to take care of all the, uh, the pipeline delay and so on. That's the reason why they, they need knobs. Um, so fundamentally, Samsung will provide the library and this will be not programmable, but only used through libraries. So that's some kind of uh, almost completely fixed things. While on our side, we try to be as programmable as possible. I mean, yes, our processor is not, we, we cannot brag about huge number on something, but our, uh, with respect to our processor, uh, I will say our processor is, uh, a, um, is reasonably good at everything, is it never excelled at anything in particular. It's bad at floating point because it has no floating point support. So that's the, uh, I, I can say this without any, any problem. Uh, but this is a really a general purpose processor. Uh, so the performance is consistent and it's not specialized for some kind of calculation more than for other. Um, we, we, so we believe in, in the fact that so many applications, even applications we don't think at all yet, will be amenable to the PIM technology the, the way we see it, which is general purpose. Uh, there is certainly a market for ultra specialized PIM technology as well. But that's not the, the market we are after. We, we are really looking for general purpose PIM, PIM. So the most programmable, the most consistent in performance and not uh, uh, with extremely high number on a few calculation and incapable of doing anything else. That, that two different markets and two different strategy. We, we choose a general purpose, purpose one on the, the fact that we are programmable in mainstream languages. Because I don't think there is that many people that want to program in assembly on the equal board. So that, that's, that's our position. So uh, uh, by definition, they are incomparable. I mean that. Uh, 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 so I mean, they are. Uh, uh, they are. They, I, I would say that they cannot be fairly compared because uh, the uh, Samsung architectures are specialized. Uh, comparable, they could be because uh, AppMem is general purpose and it even supports um, floating point, although uh, it's uh, emulated. But yeah, I, I completely understand the point. The, the other architectures are focused on a specific workloads, uh, while AppMem gives. Uh, wider range of uh, possibilities. That's, uh, that's really clear. Um, I think there are some uh, questions in the YouTube chat. Uh, hopefully, uh, Geraldo or Mohamed, can you yeah. uh, check very quickly? Yeah, yeah yes, uh, I can, yes. Oh, can, can you go, Mohamed, can I go? Uh, uh, yeah, actually, I'm going to ask one of them and then also I want to ask my question, maybe. <laughs> sure, makes sense. No problem, sorry. So, yeah, thank you. So, so yeah, there is a question in YouTube. She ask, uh, do you have any floating point units uh, in your DPU? Uh, no, we don't. Yeah. Um, for the for the application so far uh, that were relevant for PIM, it was not uh, not that much a problem. Uh, floating point operators consume a lot of wires, and as I have explained before. Wires is the things uh, that are not that much present on the DRAM process. So floating point operators will be very uh, cumbersome to do on the DRAM process. But uh, if we consider that for uh, inference on, on, uh, for the artificial intelligence stuff, the width of the data manipulated is smaller and smaller. Then at some point we can envision possibly to have some kind of floating point support for sh uh, sh uh, narrow uh, narrow floating point variables that could be that could be envisioned. But to have uh, something like a, a 30, a 32 bit floating point soft uh, support, we, we don't we don't plan to do anything about this uh, 
it will be too costly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I can understand. So actually, I have also one question. Uh, from my understanding, uh, DPUs can be communicated uh, using uh, by interaction through the host. Yes. So did you consider uh, that you know having some direct communication channels uh, between DPUs? And yeah, what actually what prevented you from enabling some communication channels? Okay, so this is likely the most frequently asked, asked uh, question. Why we don't have DPUs have not the capability to communicate between, between themselves. Mm -hmm. uh, the first thing is that it will uh, introduce a free level hierarchy. Uh, uh, in the main vision, we have just two levels of hierarchy. We have the host and the DPUs, and the DPUs are just a C of DPUs. If you have local communication inside the chip, uh, this will make the fact that you have chips visible. I mean that you will know that, okay, uh, this DPU can communicate greatly because they're on the same chip, but other DPU are very poor communication because they are not on the same chip. So this will make the programming model far more complex. But the key point is that if you uh, add communication between DPUs on the chip, the chip become invisible in the first place. <laughs> so that's the best reason not to do it. It's to provide a meaningful communication between the DPU, meaningful in terms of performance, uh, will be really, uh, I, I don't think it is feasible at all. And one of the things is that it will be an hindrance on but the scaling of the technology. Because obviously at some point we will have D, uh, DPU DRAMs with 16, DPUs instead of eight, then 32 and so on. And making these DPUs communicating efficiently with, uh, inside the chip will become more and more challenging and more and more power consuming. So that's really a deliberate choice to say that to be the most scalable possible, the most flexible possible, we just put processor along the DRAM array, and then the host will do everything. And if you have to move data between DPUs, then you will use the communication technology that your bus is based on. And this way, this technology advanced by itself. I mean, today we are on DDR4, but DDR5 exists. Uh, there will be a DDR6. Uh, so you, you see, we, we separate the problem because otherwise we will have to make evolving two different technology at once. I think uh, uh, no local uh, network on chip and then uh, the processor itself and so on. So it's really a choice. Uh, it's based on, on the fact that people that have tried to do so have failed. If you look at a startup in the past, like Venred, uh, their chip was capable of doing this, but was not really capable of being manufactured. So uh, mm -hmm. um, I, I do believe that's a bridge too far. That's uh, making efficient communication between DPUs uh, will consume most of the of the area budget, most of the power budget at the end of the day. So it's it's a losing proposition. It will be very interesting in the absolute thing. Uh, okay, when if you have no constraints or if you have in a logic process, that's the kind of thing you want to do, obviously. But the difficulty is to to trade with the reality of the Durham process, and uh, really that's um, to do uh, just the processor was difficult enough to make all of them communicating at interesting speed. Um, I believe. Yeah. Just the power consumption will just kill us already. So, no, oh, okay, yeah, I cannot imagine. Thank you, thank you. Yes, we are perfectly aware that there will be nice things. Okay, so if you if we thought it was feasible in the first place, we will have tried to do it. Our, our con conviction is that this is not a reasonable path. Mm -hmm. Yeah, makes sense. So, Geraldo, can you? Uh, move, go over other questions. Sure, sure. Uh, hello, yeah. Fabrice. Uh, there are some other questions on YouTube for you. Uh, the first one that I'm going to try to 
summarize is that uh, someone is asking basically if the upmap deans are in production, uh, working on real setups, or is still experimenting by potential customers. So, can someone purchase upmap deans at this point? Um, you can. I wouldn't say that we are. Uh, uh, okay. The, the, the the deems we sell uh, are um, typically they are customers that are evaluating the technology because it takes some time to port to to port an application to the spin concept that's some kind of uh, um, but the, the point is that all all um, performance boost today you have to to do it with I would call it exotic technology. PIM is ex exotic with respect to the classical server, but so are FPGA, so are programming GPUs or uh, programming uh, specialized AI chips. So today we are, uh, that, that's what uh, the end of Moore law is, is that you don't have a general purpose classical processing, uh, performance improvement, that um, if you want performance improvement, you are forced to use new technologies and there is a learning curve for all of these technologies and that does the same for us. Once you master the concept that you have to divide your application on a serial processor, we try to make this processor the most classical possible such that the, uh, the experience of the programmers is reused and, and the concept are familiar and so on. So, uh, but effectively, if you want to buy up mem, uh, up mem dims, uh, we can we, we can sell them to you. That's that's a, that's make us unique so far, <laughs> uh, because as far as I know, this is we are the only one where we, you can buy the product. By the way, <laughs> so that, uh, that is a great answer. Thank you so much. And in the same spirit of your answer, I guess there is a similar ish question uh, about this heterogeneity that uh, man not necessarily introduced, but like another. Uh, type of programming model, and someone is basically asking, saying that uh, as uh, he understands that MEM is uh, uh, is proposing a heterogeneous system type of programming approach, where you have the CPU and the MEM deans, and you need to partition the application. There are other um, uh, companies trying to do the same, not necessarily for PIM, but like for example, Xilinx and doing for the AI workloads or Intel recently with their own API. And then the question is, if what do you think about uh, this heterogeneous uh, space that is growing over time right now and if you think that it will be in the end a consensus uh, about those different uh, hardware architectures uh, about the programming paradigm that they will employ or some sort of like I guess OpenCL type of framework that encapsulates anything for for the for this different heterogeneous architectures it's quite a, a research uh, driven question I would say or like a broad question but yeah, it's good to know your opinion about it. Um, I am absolutely convinced, and you won't be surprised of this, that general purpose PIM, uh, general purpose PIM will have a, a very important place on the processing solution of the future. Uh, there, I am also convinced that some specific applications will be big enough to be worth developing specific architecture, which are only good at them, bad at everything else, if, if even capable of executing them at all. But so inference come to mind, obviously. Uh, so I do believe both technology with, will, will, co -habit, will, will, will share the market. Uh, because both will provide enough value to the end customer. So that, that's really a, a question of market size because developing a chip is expensive. Uh, DRAM masks are expensive too, even if they are less expensive than logic mask, <laughs> by the way. Uh, so, um, so I do believe both will exist. Uh, we intend to be the, the, the standard, to set the standard on the general purpose processing stuff because we are by far the first move the first mover on, on, I believe we have a very important advance in technologically speaking on this side. On the specialized things, one of the reasons we didn't want to go to the specialized uh, area is the problem that the algorithms today are evolving very fast. 
And this is very difficult to build a chip. Okay, when you do a chip, you, you have to think that in the best case, really the best case, it's something like 18 months, more, more likely two years. Okay, and really we should go extremely fast. So say two years. So you are aiming at a moving target. Oh, I'm doing a specialized chip. These are the kind of algorithms that wants, that's, that are the most, the bulk of the market. I want to accelerate them. And I will hope that they won't move significantly in a two years time frame. Because now I do my architecture, I fix everything, and then I go for the design. And uh, in two years, I have my chip back. If everything works extraordinarily well, and if you are thinking financing, you are more likely to think on a three years time frame, realistically speaking, because you have to manage the risk as well. So you have to, to aim your target extraordinarily precisely with an anticipation where these algorithms are added and so on. And okay, so if you have a FPGA based technology, that's, that's good because that's the purpose of the FPGA is to shorten this path and to say, okay. Uh, uh, but if you are, but the problem is that FPGA are so less dense and so less power efficient, then uh, you pay a very huge price up front. And then otherwise you have these problems of aiming at an algorithm at algorithms that are always changing, and you have this three years gap. I, I, I don't say this is impossible. I, I don't say this people won't succeed in doing this. I, I just will say this is a, an extraordinary challenge in itself. While our mission was just okay. Processor, everyone that has tried to make a processor on the ARM has failed so far. So we say we will succeed, but if we succeed, we know that since it is general purpose, we have not this problem of anticipating what will be done in a three-year uh, three time frame. We just say, okay, we, we have to make a good enough processor, and people will be able to use it today or tomorrow in three years, as we'll still be used, uh, able to use it. So. I will say that this problem of aiming in the future is really a bet the farm on something because you see, we make a processor, the processor can be that good, that good, or okay, it can, but we know that it will be usable. If you make something perfect for algorithms nobody uses anymore, uh, then you have a problem. <laughs> so. So the specialized chip that are very difficult to do, uh, there is so many, it's a very cold space. There is something like 200 startups working on AI chip, something like this, in this range. There is at least 100 we know the, the, the name of, that's just crazy. So, um, okay, so, so I, I believe there will be winner in, uh, there will, the market will be divided in, in fundamentally two parts, specialized general purpose. For the specialized, you need either to be extraordinarily good or lucky or extraordinarily well-financed to survive the fact that you will miss the target many times before hitting something. So certainly there will be chips, specialized chips to say which one, which kind of architecture. So I will say that's a risk uh, we didn't want to take. And I will say all, uh, I have no idea <laughs> what kind of technology. So far, I will say the jury is out because, okay, there is a big incumbent, the Intel of the AI, which is NVIDIA right now. Uh, and you see that the incumbent architecture still succeed in defeating new exotic architecture so far. So not to say that, I'm not saying that it will last. I have no idea. In fact, so I do believe the market will be segmented. Uh, because just of the size of the customer, uh, one, one of the problems is that the, the customers sometimes they are big enough that they want to make their higher chips themselves. So that's <laughs> another problem for the startup. So general purpose, that's uh, the things you know is that it is usable at the end of the day and anyway, anyone can use it. So um, uh, you see that's a, trading risk versus uh, market risk versus design risk and so on. So, um, so this is very interesting times. There is many interesting things 
And I would say so many that you, you have no idea that what will succeed in the specialized stuff. Uh, general purpose, uh, that's, that's more predictable, uh, more usable, more, so, um, but both, both will exist. I do believe both will exist. They will be specialized chip, specialized PIM chip. I do believe this. Um, Thank you so much for this. I think that yeah, there is space for for everyone in the market. The market is huge. <laughs> so, for everyone, for, I don't uh, for, for for several. Yes, yes, but but uh, yeah. there is just so many technology out there in the specialized field that just um, some kind of bubble. On the special, yeah. on the specialized AI chip, there is just too many chips. This is not reasonable. Yeah, thank you so much, uh, Juan. Uh, is there? Anyway, these these are uh, very interesting times, and I also agree with you that the market uh, will keep being segmented. There is a wealth of applications, all with different requirements, and and they can benefit from uh, different types of architectures. But even though the AppMem architecture is general purpose, at the moment is also targeted as, at a specific uh, market as well, right? Due to the need, I mean, installing them in, in a relatively big server. Are you thinking about in the future, for example, building chips for, even though they will be general purpose for mobile uh, processors, for example? Uh, we are thinking using Mobile processor, uh, so low power DDR5, for example. Okay, because even if you um, if you consider PIM processing, the performance of the bus connecting you to the server is is not that critical. The one of the most limiting factor is possibly the total power consumption. And uh, if you consider, for example, a server with six cell in the future, but maybe not too distant in the future, then you will have your six cell DIM and you will have a bridge chip and you will have PIM DRAMs, for example. Then you can ask yourself, is a classical DDR5 protocol between your bridge, six cell bridge, and your PIM DRAM? Is DDR5 the most efficient one to be used? Or maybe you want to use the low power versions like LPDDR5, because fundamentally you have enough bandwidth from the bridge to your DRAMs, but your concern is that you have many DIMMs and your concern is the total power consumption. So maybe we will make chips using low power uh, protocols to have this chip used in uh, uh, phones and so on. That's that's a possibility. Um, that uh, maybe the security aspect of the next chip, that's uh, this, uh, the, the, the secure enclave we can build they are more secure than any kind of other enclave because, because uh, the, the DPU is running only one application at a time. So that's, that's a point. Um, we have nothing against uh, if Apple want to <laughs> buy many, many EFM chips, that would be very nice. So, uh, Currently, we think that our technology is first aimed at server, but who, know, who knows the future? Uh, um, but using low power, the first step will be using low power protocol. And this is something that we may consider uh, at some point. That, that so, so that will make it feasible. And then if the customer wants to use them in a low power, mobile, mobile device, why not? The, the, the phone market is not a market we are currently uh, pursuing. <laughs> but, but you know, you never know, you know, <laughs> it's uh, <laughs> so. Uh, uh, but at, at least it's interesting that you consider that the, the case uh, can be good for the future. Okay, um, I, I, I want to ask very quickly uh, something as well. Uh, I, I think there will be more questions uh, from uh, the chat. But uh, so one very quick, very quick question, because uh, it relates to something you said before, uh, there is a learning curve, uh, of course, for the adoption of the of the new architecture, new ways of uh, programming. So how could you how would you say, I mean, in terms of difficulty, in terms of challenge for a 
a programmer, someone who wants to start um, uh, playing with this architecture, how, how much difficult is it than programming a multi-threaded code for CPU or for GPUs? And uh, if you are considering for the future some, you know, like a high level programming framework similar to what uh, OpenCC, OpenACC represents for GPUs. Um, I, I will say, uh, okay, okay. The, the, the thing is that the first, um, the first person which, which external to UpMem which programmed the DPUs uh, is a professor Lavenier and he did the first genomic program on DPUs in something like two months. It was running in two months, then it has been optimized over and over and over a very long uh, um, time because that was the, fir the first programming program, external program we ever had on the DPU. I, I, I will say that was a feat that someone external using the first generation of the tool, well, which were obviously uh, immature by in many, many ways, succeed in having its application running in two months. Uh, I wouldn't say this is representative. I just will say that it has been done. <laughs> so that's uh, that's uh, um, now the our tools are far more mature than the, the, the first the first the first tool, obviously. And um, um, I, I will say I, I'm likely the wrong person to, to judge of this because. Uh, for me, uh, working on the architecture for something like nine years, uh, I, when I see an application, I always think, oh, it should be multi-threaded and this way, this way, okay. Um, the things for me, which is critical is what are the alternative? I mean that all performance improving technologies, they have learning curves that are very consequential as well. So, I hope, and we have the main aim of having a learning curve, the most, the most simple because of the following property. The UpMem architecture, you are just to keep in mind that, okay, each DPU see only its own 64 megabyte of memory. You have threads, you have no cache. You have to explicit manage your memory. These are the three I would say drawback of our programming model, okay? Because in the best world possible, you will not have any of this. But besides these three rules, you have no other rules. I mean that when you on there will be from generation from generation, that will be always the same rules. That will be that uh, uh, trading, um, explicit management of memory between a fast memory and a, on a slow DRAM memory. Um, on, uh, on the, the memory is divided by each chunk and you have one DPU every, every chunk, okay? So once you have this concept in mind, then you know you won't be beaten back by any kind of unpleasant surprise. The performance of the processor is very consistent. It is not weak on anything. Okay, you have, we have no floating point, but so far the the application, they were not floating point based. So the problem was uh, moot, by the way. So really, this, so this is an intelligible, uh, these, are, these rules, they are high level. They are intelligible. I mean that uh, they are quite abstract. While on all the other technologies, the set of constraints which is exposed to the programmer is far more complex on change from generation to generation and so on. So I will say that our, our thinking is to, okay, there is a learning curve to everything. But the thing is that once you get familiar with the technology, then everything is always the same and you know, uh, on when you have, uh, uh, when you know how to master this only these three rules, then you can think your application in a PIM way uh, directly without any unpleasant surprise in terms of performance in that, oh, but that's very bad at this, and but no. So um, we believe it is this to be a key advantage is that uh, you can easily understand the, the, 
the rules you have to obey for, they are high level, intelligible, and consistent. And we pretend that this is not the case for any other technology, PIM technology uh, uh, so far, because they have very complex rules and uh, the, the difficulty in mastering them seem doting. So, so I, I will say fundamentally that, um, so judging of the difficulty of dealing with these three rules, that's a personal matter based on experience, what you're programmed for if you are used to heavily par parallelism and so on. But the key point is these rules are not some kind of obscure, oh yes, you can, uh, this chip can uh, discuss with this name, but not with the next one and so on. When you have, um, processor mesh and so on, you have really weak points. Incidentally, your performance can crumble to an alt almost. And these are very complex to anticipate. So you have, you have application programs which are fragile. Sometimes they work well and incidentally, that's a disaster and so on. This is fundamentally the kind of drawback we avoid. Uh, so we expose three rules. They are significant, I, I, I agree. I mean, it's not nothing to say your memory is divided in chunk and your processor cannot communicate directly with another processor, that's true. But once you know them, you know everything you need to know to program, to program. and it's only three rules. So that I would say that's, that's uh, uh, so now going the way ahead and saying we should, we should have some kind of language framework to facilitate this, obviously we are thinking to this. Obviously, that's a way, but you know, this is very, this is big stuff because you, you have really to define the, the right concept to have the, 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 the right thing. So today we are providing more and more mature tools at the classical programming level. And we are not yet at providing an higher abstract level, but obviously we are thinking of doing it. Uh, the thing is that we want first to have first place to really to have the, uh, all the classical tools to be to be just uh, a top level uh, in terms of compiler, debugger, everything, uh, such that uh, programmers, once they master the free rules, they have a very uh, high class uh, programming environment. Uh, so that's, uh, but if obviously this is, this is a thing on our mind is uh, to provide a higher abstraction to, to ease the uh, writing of PIM, PIM applications this way. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, thanks for the answer. I think that uh, all of that makes sense. Uh, I can very briefly contribute my experience. I've been uh, programming the admin system for already a couple of years. I, I have seen how the uh, documentation and the tools have uh, significantly improved. And, um, and for sure, it's, uh, I mean, it's not more challenging than any other parallel architecture. And today we have uh, parallel computing courses everywhere. Uh, teaching GPU programming, and, and I believe that um, uh, pro uh, processing in memory programming will also be incorporated to many of these parallel um, uh, programming courses as we are already uh, doing here at ETH. Um, okay, are there more questions from the audience, Mohamed? Uh, yes, I think uh, there is one question in the YouTube chat. So yeah, talking about the future hardware, do you plan to include hardware arithmetic features as for example, to permit shift registers, carry chains, maybe also mocks? Yeah. Um, we have a bar, okay. So we have shift instruction, addition shift, all the instruction you will expect from a classical risk processor. Uh, we have a small multiplier, so we, that's not the best chip to make heavily multiply centric uh, uh, application. Uh, we have a few new instructions in the, ne in the next generation, like the uh, butterfly, uh, bit reverse things. Uh, I don't think we are missing any particular integer operators. We have the capability to count bits, to count uh, 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 leading bits also uh, as well. Um, so we, in terms of operators, we try always to implement things that are the most general purpose or very, very useful uh, for many applications like bit counting on a, 
uh, most significant bit counting and so on. These are things which are very painful to, to do in terms of performance when you don't have them and they are not that expensive in terms of operators. So that's the reason why we have them. So we, we already try to find uh, operations that are, uh, which, which provide a good value in terms of implementation costs with respect to the fact that they are reasonably used by several applications and that they are really costly to do uh, by emulation when you don't have them. So we try to, to balance these two things. Floating point is today is too expensive and not that needed for the kind of application we are we are dealing with today. Um, so uh, uh, if you have precise idea uh, in mind, I, I, I would like to, to, to learn them, but um, so uh, mm. uh, we have, yeah, we have, right. uh, we yes. have uh, our architecture is a 32 bit processor, but we have some helpers which simplifies the calculation of 64-bit value like uh, C flag. Uh, we have a zero flag for extended, uh, extended uh, calculation for the, of, uh, the nullity of a value, non-nullity, and, and the yeah. value. So we, we have some kind of 64-bit enhancement support on our 32-bit processor. Um, these are capable of making a multiple world shift as well. So um, I believe we are well equipped in terms of bit manipulation and shift. Uh, in fact, our shift unit is more powerful than all the 32 bit shift units I'm aware of. I mean that we have instructions that uh, uh, you, you, you can shift one instead of zero. Uh, uh, we have the rotation. Uh, um, we have a shift and add. <laughs> we have even a shift and add. Uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so um, uh, I don't know um, if there is something missing. I would like to know, but uh, I believe we we have encompassed the most frequent uh, mm -hmm. needed instruction in terms of integer uh, integer arithmetic and logic. Yeah. Thank you. Actually, yeah, your answer makes a lot of sense to me. And as you said, in the end, we need to take into account the cost and the benefit because we have, you know, we are limited in the cost in this uh, data and processors. So yeah, Juan, I think uh, there is no other questions in the YouTube chat. I would, uh, I don't know me if uh, you guys want to ask uh, something else. I, I would like to ask one more. Uh, um, so in, in you might have uh, seen that we have also been, uh, I mean, recently published uh, another study, SPMB on the, on the AppM architecture. And one, I mean, the, the way that the uh, story um, is explained in, in this work is that we are uh, also evaluating what's the cost and providing and proposing strategies for the data movement between the uh, main memory and the um, theme enabled memory. Um, in my understanding is that, uh, I mean, these strategies and these, uh, let's say, bottleneck that the uh, current theme system has um, can be uh, easily uh, relieved is if, uh, if the theme enabled memory manages to substitute the main memory at some point, or, or in other words, if the main memory itself uh, can embed uh, processing in memory capabilities. Are there any fundamental limitations for that to happen? Yes, <laughs> yes. The problem is that, okay, one key, uh, 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 I spoke about three rules in terms of uh, the rules a programmer has to, to deal with. But we have another, other people to interact with as a mem the programmers, obviously, but the DRAM manufacturers as well. And one key rule we have with respect to the DRAM manufacturer is to say our technology don't mess with the array, with the DRAM array. And this is an extraordinary important rule to have uh, to, to, to be manufactured. I mean that uh, 
they are manufacturers fundamentally don't want anyone but themselves to mess with their, with their DRAMRI. This is just some kind of a showstopper. They, are, they have good reason for, because when you, the more you, you get into the knowledge of the DRAMRI, the more you understand their standpoint. It's just that the things are far more complex. Okay, everyone, I will say, has an understanding of the DRAM array as a high level, okay. But um, you have really to think that even the, 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 the lines, they are, they, are, they, are not, they are not square this way. They are, in fact, they are in diagonals. So everything is just optimized to a level which is just somewhat crazy. And if you ask them to disturb this, by inserting logic inside. I, I will say you have, as an external company, you have not uh, uh, knowledge to, to do something relevant to, to be feasible. So the only ones which could implement something like this would be the DRM manufacturers themselves because of the impact on the under, under, uh, underlying technologies they are using themselves. If, if you see, only them have the knowledge, uh, you, you, you can make an IP on insert it into, into the mi middle of a DRAM array. This is just not feasible. So we are along the memory, the DRAM array, and that's the reason why we can be, uh, we have a product, we have a chip. And inside the DRAM array, this will be really another stuff. When you see that Samsung chip, you see that fundamentally the DRAM array are unchanged. They have just removed the DRAM array and put the logic in the middle. But you see that the DRAM array are the same than the chip before. It's just that you have less of them. So uh, it is certainly tempting to think to architecture where you have calculation exploiting the extraordinary parallelism you have inside the DRAM array. Uh, but so far, this seems to be not feasible because the uh, DRAM array is at that optimization level already, which is past the, the time where you can insert anything which is not related to the memory functionality inside. So I, I do this to be feasible. It would be nice if it was feasible. Maybe it was feasible in the past when the DRAM process were not that optimized. Uh, I, I'm doubtful about this being feasible today. Uh, maybe on the trench capacitor processes of from 10, 15 years ago, there will be there, there were some some window to do this technical window. I, I my understanding is such a window has disappeared in the meantime because of the extraordinary aggressiveness of the of the DRAM array. You have to think that they, they are on a comb. I mean that it's the, the the things are, are packed in, not in a, in a square matrix, but in fact, in a, like the, the B will have done. So really that's, um, um, so for me, this kind of uh, architecture improvement inside the memory array, today and for the first, first future, I don't think they are manufacturable anymore or not at the scale the DRAM industry is used to. I mean, maybe, uh, but in, in this case, this will be extremely expensive chip uh, with very low yield or, or something like this, okay? So um, my feeling is that this is a key, a key point with the main technologies can we, we can set to the DRAM manufacturer. We are independent, mostly independent of the technology you are using on your DRAM array. So we can then be integrated from one generation to the next and we are easy to integrate. Uh, that's, that's the current situation. I'm, I'm sorry if it's some kind of a cold rain on some clever trick inside the DRAM array. I know there is many, but the problem is manufacturer, manufacturability so far. Uh, I, I'm very skeptical. I, I just want to be wrong because that will be a huge improvement, but as, my feeling is that today the technology doesn't allow this. Well, I, I think that a uh, good thing of uh, your work and what uh, Abmem is doing is that it's helping uh, to you know, change mindsets as well. 
So uh, maybe things will be easier from the uh, DRAM vendor's perspective in the future. In fact, I, I mean, doing this is taking a huge risk for the DRAM manufacturer. Obviously, if you prove a market by having more and more ping algorithms and technology, then at some point, the DRAM manufacturer can say, I will take the risk. I will implement something in the middle of my DRAM array. But to reach this point, you must have such a market momentum that the risk is worth uh, to be taken. The only thing I can say is that today, a key advantage of UpMem technology is for, uh, uh, and, uh, for the Durham partner to, to be able to say the, 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 fry, the phrase, the sentence, we don't mess with the Durham array. So uh, that, that's, we know that we, if we were saying something else, <laughs> that would be a red light. <laughs> today, that's the state of the situation, okay? Uh, later on, uh, if there is such, such compelling argument to be made for this, then maybe the situation will be different. I would say that we are breaking the market, we are introducing the technology. I know that if we were messing with the array, that would be a no-show. That would be not acceptable because of the risk, uh, of the cost of the risk associated to, of, in doing so. That will, that's just the, the, the bare truth of the, of the situation today. So uh, if you have some, some solution incredibly efficient for some problem, which requires some modification of the DRAM array, and there is a market for doing so, then the things change. But we are not yet uh, here. So that's... Uh... Okay, yeah, sounds good. Uh, thank you very much for the answer, Fabrice. Um, Mohammed, there, are there any other questions? or other questions from uh, people here in Zoom? So, yeah, there is no question in YouTube uh, chat. Uh, I'm not sure about other attendees in Zoom. Okay, anyone? Okay, I don't have my question, any more questions myself, uh, Fabrice. Uh, uh, we really appreciate uh, your presentation, the time that you have spent with us and uh, all the very comprehensive answers. I think that, uh, um, I mean, you clarified a lot of things about the architecture and its uh, future evolution and, and we, will, uh, we will continue keeping an eye on uh, everything, uh, what you do. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Goodbye, Vaya. Thank you. Thank you, Fabrice. Thank you. Fabrice. Thank you. Thank you again. And thank you, everyone attending the, uh, this uh, talk in Zoom and in YouTube. We hope to see you soon in a new uh, 